Book One, Part Nine of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One. Part Nine, Paragraphs 164 to 185. In such a manner the Phocians' wall was built. Harpagus marched against the city and besieged it, but he made overtures and said that it would suffice him if the Phocians would demolish one rampart of the wall and dedicate one house. But the Phocians, very indignant at the thought of slavery, said they wanted to deliberate for a day, and then they would answer. But while they were deliberating, Harpagus must withdraw his army from the walls, they said. Harpagus said that he well knew what they intended to do, but that nevertheless he would allow them to deliberate. So when Harpagus withdrew his army from the walls, the Phocians launched their fifty-oared ships, embarked their children and women and all their movable goods, besides the statues from the temples and everything dedicated in them except bronze or stonework or painting, and then embarked themselves and set sail for Chios. And the Persians took Phocia, left thus uninhabited. The Phocians would have bought the islands called Inusi from the Chians, but the Chians would not sell them, because they feared that the islands would become a market, and so their own island be cut off from trade. So the Phocians prepared to sail to Cyanus, where, at the command of an oracle, they had built a city called Alalia twenty years before. Arganthonius was by this time dead. While getting ready for their voyage, they first sailed to Phocia, where they destroyed the Persian guard to whom Harpagus had entrusted the defence of the city, and when this was done, they called down mighty curses on any one of them who should stay behind when the rest sailed. Not only this, but they sank a mass of iron in the sea, and swore never to return to Phocia before the iron should appear again. But while they prepared to sail to Cyanus, more than half of the citizens were overcome with longing and pitiful sorrow for the city and the life of their land, and they broke their oath and sailed back to Phocia. Those of them who kept the oath put out to sea from the Inusi. And when they came to Cyanus, they lived there for five years as one community with those who had come first and they founded temples there. But they harassed and plundered all their neighbours, as a result of which the Tyrrhenians and Carthaginians made common cause against them, and sailed to attack them with sixty ships each. The Phocians also manned their ships, sixty in number, and met the enemy in the sea called Sardonium. They engaged, and the Phocians won, yet it was only a kind of Cadmian victory, for they lost forty of their ships, and the twenty that remained were useless, their rams twisted awry. Then, sailing to Alalia, they took their children and women and all of their possessions that their ships could hold on board, and leaving Cyanus, they sailed to Regium. As for the crews of the disabled ships, the Carthaginians and Tyrrhenians drew lots for them, and of the Tyrrhenians the Agilioi were allotted by far the majority, and these they led out and stoned to death. But afterwards everything from Agila that passed the place where the stone Phocians lay, whether sheep or beasts of burden or men, became distorted and crippled and palsied. The Agileans sent to Delphi, wanting to mend their offence, and the Pythian priestess told them to do what the people of Agila do to this day, for they pay great honours to the Phocians with religious rites and games and horse-races. Such was the end of this part of the Phocians. 
those of them who fled to Phrygium set out from there and gained possession of that city in the Enotian country, which is now called Hyeli. They founded this because they learned from a man of Posidonia that the Cyanus, whose establishment the Pythian priestess ordained, was the hero, and not the island. Thus, then, it went with the Ionian Phocea. The Teans did the same things as the Phoceans. When Harpagus had taken their walled city by building an earthwork, they all embarked aboard ship and sailed away for Thrace. There they founded a city, Abdera, which before this had been founded by Timesius of Cladzomini. Yet he got no profit of it, but was driven out by the Thracians. This Timesius is now honoured as a hero by the Teans of Abdera. These were the only Ionians who left their native lands unable to endure slavery. The rest of the Ionians, except the Milesians, though they faced Harpagus in battle as did the exiles, and conducted themselves well, each fighting for his own country, yet when they were defeated and their cities taken, they remained where they were and did as they were told. The Milesians, as I have already said, made a treaty with Cyrus himself and struck no blow. Thus Ionia was enslaved for the second time, and when Harpagus had conquered the Ionians of the mainland, the Ionians of the islands, fearing the same fate, surrendered to Cyrus. When the Ionians, despite their evil plight, nonetheless assembled at the Pan-Ionian, Bias of Priene, I have learned, gave them very useful advice, and had they followed it they might have been the most prosperous of all Greeks, for he advised them to put out to sea and sail altogether to Sardo, and then found one city for all Ionians. Thus, possessing the greatest island in the world and ruling others, they would be rid of slavery and have prosperity. But if they stayed in Ionia, he could see, he said, no hope of freedom for them. This was the advice which Bias of Priene gave after the destruction of the Ionians, and that given before the destruction by Thales of Miletus, a Phoenician by descent, was good too. He advised that the Ionians have one place of deliberation, and that it be in Teos, for that was the centre of Ionia, and that the other cities be considered no more than deems. Harpagus, after subjugating Ionia, made an expedition against the Carians, Cornians, and Lycians, taking Ionians and Aeolians with him. Of these, the Carians have come to the mainland from the islands, for in the past they were islanders, called Lelegies, and under the rule of Minos, not, as far as I can learn by report, paying tribute, but manning ships for him when he needed them. Since Minos had subjected a good deal of territory for himself, and was victorious in war, this made the Carians too at that time by far the most respected of all nations. They invented three things in which they were followed by the Greeks. It was the Carians who originated wearing crests on their helmets and devices on their shields, and who first made grips for their shields. Until then all who used shields carried them without these grips, and guided them with leather belts which they slung round the neck and over the left shoulder. Then, a long time afterwards, the Carians were driven from the islands by Dorians and Ionians, and so came to the mainland. This is the Cretan story about the Carians, but the Carians themselves do not subscribe to it, but believe that they are aboriginal inhabitants of the mainland, and always bore the name which they bear now, and they point to an ancient shrine of Carian Zeus at Mylassa, to which Mysians and Lydians, as brethren of the Carians, for Lydus and Mysus, they say, were brothers of Care, are admitted but not those who spoke the same language as the Carians, but were of another people. I think the Cornians are aborigines of the soil, but they say that they came from Crete. Their speech has become like the Carian, 
or the carrion like theirs, for I cannot clearly decide. But in their customs they diverge widely from the carrions as from all other men. Their chief pleasure is to assemble for drinking bouts in groups according to their ages and friendships, men, women, and children. Certain foreign rites of worship were established among them, but afterwards, when they were inclined otherwise and wanted to worship only the gods of their fathers, all Cornian men of full age put on their armour and went together as far as the boundaries of Kalinda, striking the air with their spears and saying that they were casting out the alien gods. Such are their ways. The Lycians were from Crete in ancient times, for in the past none that lived on Crete were Greek. Now there was a dispute in Crete about the royal power between Sarpedon and Minos, sons of Europa. Minos prevailed in this dispute, and drove out Sarpedon and his partisans, who after being driven out came to the Mylian land in Asia. What is now possessed by the Lycians was in the past Mylian, and the Mylians were then called Solimai. For a while Sarpedon ruled them, and the people were called Termili, which was the name that they had brought with them, and that is still given to the Lycians by their neighbours. But after Lycus, son of Pandion, came from Athens, banished as well by his brother Aegeus, to join Sarpedon in the land of the Termili, they came in time to be called Lycians after Lycus. Their customs are partly Cretan and partly Carian, but they have one which is their own and shared by no other men. They take their names not from their fathers but from their mothers, and when one is asked by his neighbour who he is, he will say that he is the son of such a mother, and rehearse the mothers of his mother. Indeed, if a female citizen marries a slave, her children are considered pure-blooded. But if a male citizen, even the most prominent of them, takes an alien wife or concubine, the children are dishonoured. Neither the Carians nor any Greeks who dwell in this country did anything notable before they were all enslaved by Harpagus. Among those who inhabit it are certain Cnidians, colonists from Lacedaemon. Their country, it is called the Triopian, lies between the sea and that part of the peninsula which belongs to Bubassus, and all but a small part of the Cnidian territory is washed by the sea, for it is bounded on the north by the gulf of Ceramicus, and on the south by the sea of Cyme and Rhodes. Now while Harpagus was conquering Ionia, the Cnidians dug a trench across this little space, which is about two-thirds of a mile wide, in order that their country might be an island. So they brought it all within the entrenchment, for the frontier between the Cnidian country and the mainland is on the isthmus across which they dug. Many of them were at this work, and seeing that the workers were injured when breaking stones more often and less naturally than usual, some in other ways but most in the eyes, the Cnidians sent envoys to Delphi to inquire what it was that opposed them. Then, as they themselves say, the priestess gave them this answer in iambic verse. Do not wall or trench the isthmus. Zeus would have given you an island if he had wanted to. At this answer from the priestess, the Cnidians stopped their digging, and when Harpagus came against them with his army, they surrendered to him without resistance. There were Pedersians dwelling inland above Halicarnassus. When any misfortune was approaching them or their neighbours, the priestess of Athena grew a long beard. This had happened to them thrice. These were the only men near Caria who held out for long against Harpagus, and they gave him the most trouble. They fortified a hill called Lydi. The Pedersians were at length taken, and when Harpagus led his army into the plain of Xanthus, the Lycians came out to meet him, and showed themselves courageous, fighting few against many. But being beaten and driven into the city, 
they gathered their wives and children and goods and servants into the Acropolis, and then set the whole Acropolis on fire. Then they swore great oaths to each other, and sallying out fell fighting all the men of Xanthus. Of the Xanthians who claim now to be Lycians, the greater number, all except eighty households, are of foreign descent. These eighty families, as it happened, were away from the city at that time, and thus survived. So Harpagus gained Xanthus, and Cornus too in a somewhat similar manner, the Cornians following for the most part the example of the Lycians. Harpagus then made havoc of Lower Asia. In the upper country Cyrus himself vanquished every nation, leaving none untouched. Of the greater part of these I will say nothing, but will speak only of those which gave Cyrus the most trouble, and are most worthy of being described. When Cyrus had made all the mainland submit to him, he attacked the Assyrians. In Assyria there are many other great cities, but the most famous and the strongest was Babylon, where the royal dwelling had been established after the destruction of Ninus. Babylon was a city such as I will now describe. It lies in a great plain, and is in shape a square, each side fifteen miles in length. Thus sixty miles make the complete circuit of the city. Such is the size of the city of Babylon. And it was planned like no other city of which we know. Around it runs first a moat deep and wide and full of water, and then a wall eighty-three feet thick and three hundred thirty-three feet high. The royal measure is greater by three fingers' breadth than the common measure. Further, I must relate where the earth was used as it was dug from the moat, and how the wall was constructed. As they dug the moat, they made bricks of the earth which was carried out of the place they dug, and when they had moulded bricks enough, they baked them in ovens, then, using hot bitumen for cement, and interposing layers of wattled reeds at every thirtieth course of bricks, they built first the border of the moat, and then the wall itself in the same fashion. On the top, along the edges of the wall, they built houses of a single room facing each other, with space enough between to drive a four-horse chariot. There are a hundred gates in the circuit of the wall, all of bronze, with posts and lintels of the same. There is another city, called Is, eight days' journey from Babylon, where there is a little river, also named Is, a tributary of the Euphrates River. From the source of this river Is, many lumps of bitumen rise with the water, and from there the bitumen was brought for the wall of Babylon. Thus, then, this wall was built. The city is divided into two parts, for it is cut in half by a river named Euphrates, a wide, deep, and swift river flowing from Armenia and issuing into the Red Sea. The angles of the wall, then, on either side, are built quite down to the river. Here they turn, and from here a fence of baked bricks runs along each bank of the stream. The city itself is full of houses three and four stories high, and the ways that traverse it, those that run crosswise towards the river and the rest, are all straight. Further, at the end of each road, there was a gate in the riverside fence, one gate for each alley. These gates also were of bronze, and these too opened on the river. These walls are the city's outer armour. Within them there is another encircling wall, nearly as strong as the other, but narrower. In the middle of one division of the city stands the royal palace, surrounded by a high and strong wall, and in the middle of the other is still to this day the sacred enclosure of Zeus Belus, a square of four hundred and forty yards each way, with gates of bronze. In the centre of this sacred enclosure 
a solid tower has been built, two hundred and twenty yards long and broad. A second tower rises from this, and from it yet another, until at last there are eight. The way up them mounts spirally outside the height of the towers. About halfway up is a resting place, with seats for repose, where those who ascend sit down and rest. In the last tower there is a great shrine, and in it stands a great and well-covered couch and a golden table nearby. But no image has been set up in the shrine, nor does any human creature lie there for the night, except one native woman, chosen from all women by the god, as the Chaldeans say, who are priests of this god. These same Chaldeans say, though I do not believe them, that the god himself is accustomed to visit the shrine and rest on the couch, as in Thebes of Egypt, as the Egyptians say, for there too a woman sleeps in the temple of Theban Zeus, and neither the Egyptian nor the Babylonian woman, it is said, has intercourse with men, and as does the prophetess of the god at Patera in Lycia, whenever she is appointed, for there is not always a place of divination there, but when she is appointed, she is shut up in the temple during the night. In the Babylonian temple there is another shrine below, where there is a great golden image of Zeus sitting at a great golden table, and the footstool and the chair are also gold. The gold of the whole was said by the Chaldeans to be eight hundred talents weight. Outside the temple is a golden altar, there is also another great altar, on which are sacrificed the full grown of the flocks. Only nurslings may be sacrificed on the golden altar, but on the greater altar the Chaldeans even offer a thousand talents weight of frankincense yearly when they keep the festival of this god. And in the days of Cyrus there was still in this sacred enclosure a statue of solid gold twenty feet high. I myself have not seen it, but I relate what is told by the Chaldeans. Darius, son of Hystaspes, proposed to take this statue, but dared not. Xerxes, his son, took it, and killed the priest who warned him not to move the statue. Such is the furniture of this temple, and there are many private offerings besides. Now among the many rulers of this city of Babylon, whom I shall mention in my Assyrian history, who finished the building of the walls and the temples, there were two that were women. The first of these lived five generations earlier than the second, and her name was Semiramis. It was she who built dikes on the plain, a notable work, before that the whole plain used to be flooded by the river. The second queen, whose name was Nitocris, was a wiser woman than the first. She left such monuments as I shall record, and moreover seeing that the kingdom of Media was great and restless, and Ninus itself among other cities had fallen to it, she took such precautions as she could for her protection. First she dealt with the river Euphrates, which flows through the middle of her city. This had been straight before, but by digging canals higher up, she made the river so crooked that its course now passes one of the Assyrian villages three times. The village which is so approached by the Euphrates is called Arderica. And now those who travel from our sea to Babylon must spend three days as they float down the Euphrates, coming three times to the same village. Such was this work, and she built an embankment along either shore of the river, marvellous for its greatness and height. Then, a long way above Babylon, she dug the reservoir of a lake, a little way off from the river, always digging deep enough to find water, and making the circumference a distance of fifty-two miles. What was dug out of this hole she used to embank either edge of the river, and when she had it all dug she brought stones 
and made a key all around the lake. Her purpose in making the river wind and turning the hole into marsh was this, that the current might be slower because of the many windings that broke its force, and that the passages to Babylon might be crooked, and that right after them should come also the long circuit of the lake. All this work was done in that part of the country where the passes are and the shortest road from Media, so that the Medes might not mix with her people and learn of her affairs. End of Book One, Part Nine Recording by Graham Redmond